Hare Krishna. So we'll dedicate this session to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vidhan Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya of International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON. Our today's session is Tips to Overcome Suffering. And this is our third session. Uh, and we will be covering a total of nine sessions in this course. We have already covered, uh, we have talked about happiness. And then last session, we covered uh, some of the key success factors, right? So today is very important session because, you know, somehow or the other, we all are suffering. There are different kinds of sufferings, but we all suffer. And let's see that what are those things, right? We will do a root cause analysis. And here is the agenda of, you know, what is the root cause of those sufferings? Uh, and we will touch base upon these things, attachment, comparison, and wrong acts. So these are the three things we will highlight today in our sessions as, you know, root causes of suffering. And then we will end the session by sharing practical tips of the day. Um, so what are the root cause of suffering, right? Uh, and... Uh, we have seen, we have done some analysis that people around us, right? We want them to be happy and they do everything in their lives to be happy. We saw in our first session that how everyone is engaged in different kinds of activities to be just happy, right? And they do get happiness. It's not that they don't get, but it is temporary. It's not up to their satisfaction. And Unfortunately, it is accompanied by a hell lot of sufferings, right? Now, we shortlisted these three as the important causes of suffering. Attachment to temporary things. Attitude of comparison. Like we always live in the world of comparison. If I have this thing, you know, how more do I have in comparison to my relatives, to my friends, to my neighbors, right? And it, it is not only at individual level, but it's same for society, my society, your society, my state, your state, my country, your country. So it's a world of comparison, you know, and we will see how it causes suffering, right? And then sometimes we end up committing wrong acts, even though we don't want to, but unfortunately we do end up committing wrong acts, right? So let's start with attachment as the cause of suffering. And, you know, this attachment is not just mere attachment, but this attachment is attachment to temporary things, right? Because anything which is temporary will cause suffering. Okay. So I'll, I'll start by sharing an example, uh, uh, anecdotal um, story, basically. Uh, assume that your friend who is going out of the city, uh, he comes and requests you, can you please keep 10 lakh rupees for a period of seven days? And when I come back, I'll take this back from you. And you say, okay, that's fine. That's not a problem. And you keep the 10 lakh rupees with you. And when the friend comes back, he, he comes back to you and asks, okay, uh, I've come back now and can you please uh, give me the 10 lakh rupees which I kept with you and you just, you know, graciously, uh, you know, give the money back, right? Now, in this whole transaction, when he comes and gives 10 lakh rupees to you and when, you know, he comes back from his trip and asks you, like, you don't feel any anxiety in giving that money back to him because it was not your money. It was his money and you knew that, he has temporarily kept it with you, right? So once, you know, the money goes from you, you don't feel any problem. You don't feel any anxiety, right? But suppose if today you won a lottery of 10 lakh rupees, right? And you get that 10 lakh rupees uh, deposited in your account. And assume that after a week's time, a thief comes 
and he steals that 10 lakh rupees from you. And when you get up the next day, you are in a state of shock. You will have a lot of anxiety. You know, you will be really very, very troublesome. You know, you will have a lot of anxiety and, and, you know, you will go to the police station. You will try to do everything to get that money back, right? So now what is which made you suffer because you lost this money and how is it different from the you know um, first example where you know the the person just kept it because you get you got attached to that 10 lakh rupees which you won right from the lottery and in the initial example you always knew that my friend is temporarily keeping that money with me Right. So the difference is all about attachment. When you get attached to something and you you lose it, you know, that creates a lot of problems. Let, that creates a lot of anxiety. Right. So that is what we are going to evaluate today and go deep into it. Okay. And we will see how Bhagavad Gita teaches us some lessons on how to overcome sufferings. Right. So last time we discussed that Arjuna gave several reasons that why he should not be fighting in this battle of Kurukshetra, right? And the first reason he said that, why should I punish? Why should I kill my own family members, right? And then we discussed that because he was a Kshatriya, he was representing, uh, you know, as a leader, the, the humanity, so his, this so-called compassion for his family members was due to his false attachment, right? And as a leader, he should not be having that, right? And then in second chapter, which we are discussing today, Krishna starts his instruction on how to deal with this attachment, right? Understanding what is temporary and then acting on the platform of permanence is what Krishna is going to teach us uh, through Bhagavad Gita in, ch in chapter second. And this is his first lesson of Bhagavad Gita in Bhagavad Gita, right? And this brings us to a very interesting subject of body and soul. The, this is the first lesson which Krishna is going to teach us, right? So is attachment wrong? Is attachment altogether wrong, right? And let's see it with an example again. Like, for example, if you are traveling in a train and uh, you know you have a whole berth for you, right? Now, you will try to clean that berth. You know, you spread your bed sheet there and you will sit there or lie down, right? And you will try to keep it clean and make sure that you know everything is clean around it is proper and no one is disturbing you there, right? But once you offboard the train, right? Once you go away the train, if your mind is still contemplates on that birth, now who will sit on that birth? Will the person keep the birth clean, right? What will he do? And all those contemplation. So is it correct? Is it something which is sane? Right. So I hope all of you would agree that, you know, this looks a bit crazy. Right. So that is what we are going to discuss today. That attachment to temporary things. Right. Is what causes suffering and mere attachment is not what is, you know, totally wrong. So here we go um, with our first verse for today. Uh, and this verse is from second chapter and the verse number is 13th. Dehino asmin yatha dehe komaram yovanam jara tatha dehantar praptir dhiras tatra namuyati. As the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. So here, Krishna is telling Arjuna that soul, even in this body, is passing from one body to another. And how is this? Right? 
we are just one body so how come is krishna saying that the soul is you know it's not just at the end of the it's 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 towards death or it's uh, at death that it will take new body but krishna here is saying that even in this body we are we means soul is changing body right that means you know and according to science right all you know the cells of the body would be changed in every 7 years so there is a cycle where every 7 years you get a new body and you would see that cells keep dropping off keeps dying and we we develop new cells we get new cells right so that is what krishna is saying that even in this life we are changing bodies the soul is transmigrating from boyhood to youth to old age right and at the end at the end means at the time of death we then again get a new body okay so here i will share with you and you know i would um, have requested you to unmute and if you want to uh, let me know what do you think um, you know who the, these people are you know i'm sharing the photographs right here is another photograph and the third photograph and the fourth photograph right so can anyone uh, attempt to tell me you know who these people are mahatma gandhi yes right so he is mahatma gandhi thanks ishwar so but we see that how mahatma gandhi looks totally different in his different age groups right it would be difficult for someone who you know who is totally new who has never seen these photographs before right so that is what krishna is saying in the 13th shlok that even in this body we are changing our body the soul is transmigrating from one body to another right so when krishna says dehi no asmin yatha dehe komaram yovaram jara right so he says dehi no asmin yatha deha so who here is dehi and who is deha right so what is deha deha is the body while dehi is residing in deha right so soul who is dehi is residing in deha which is body and there are actually two coverings of body it is not just you know the body which we see the body which we see with our eyes is known as gross body but there is another body which is known as subtle body right so there is an inner covering which is known as subtle body and then there is an outer covering which is known as gross body and i'll tell you what these are but for you to initially understand that the soul like we have two coverings of different types of body one body which we can perceive with our eyes with our senses is known as gross body right and the other is subtle body okay so here is another shloka where krishna is highlighting these components of the soul of us bhumir apo analo vayu kham mano buddhir evacha ahankar iti amme bhinn prakartir astadha earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and false ego all together these constitute my separated material energies so here krishna is highlighting this fact that there are eight different elements which are basically constituting this whole body right we have seen these panch mahabhut earth water fire air ether right we we must have heard these right that we are made up of panch mahabhut this body is made up of right but then on top of this there is there are three other things mind intelligence and false ego so mind intelligence and false ego is what constitute the subtle body right and i will take you uh, and discuss more details around these things but i just wanted to show that here in in the seventh chapter fourth shloka krishna is highlighting these different components of 
our body right so uh, going little further we'll see krishna what krishna has to talk about the soul apareyam itastu anyam prakartim vedhi me param jiva bhuta mahabaho yajedam dharite jagat besides these o oh mighty arm arjun there is another superior energy of mind which comprises the living entities who are exploiting the resources of this material inferior nature so here krishna is saying that establishing the presence of soul right and krishna is saying that that soul is actually superior energy of mind while these eight components right earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and false ego these are inferior and the soul unfortunately is busy in exploiting these resources right so now i i would like to take you to where i said that let's go and discuss what these eight components are right these are two layers of body gross body and subtle body gross body has five components earth water fire air ether right so you know for example our skin organs eyes you know our speech the whole process of breathing everything these are made up of these five gross elements while we have three subtle elements now subtle elements is what goes with the soul after we leave this body so at the time of the death we leave the gross body behind and the soul goes along with the subtle body and decides which body we will get depending on the desires depending on our karma which we will discuss in subsequent sessions right so what is the role of mind intelligence and false ego right now mind is something you know which on the basis of past experience create something like it's likes and dislikes that i like this depending on my past experience of eating something or you know about friends on people around us that i like this thing but i don't like this thing right while what is the role of intelligence intelligence gives us you know all the human beings basically a sense of uh, power of discrimination right um, and it helps us to basically take a decision whether what we are doing is correct or incorrect right now for one person that thing may be correct and for other person that thing may be incorrect right for example you know all the terrorism which uh, you know pakistan tries to you know spread in india it is part of their strategy and when it does that it thinks it is you know correct and this is the right way while for india it's not correct right and for every for something may be correct for me but it might may be incorrect for you seemingly right and oppose it so what is the basis of that what is what should be the basis of our intellect so the acharyas the spiritual leaders the authorities say that vedas should be that authority on the basis of which our intellect should decide whether things is correct or incorrect now uh, let me give you an example of what is the relation between mind and intelligence now for example uh, if there is a diabetic person who has diabetes right um, and the diabetic person sees there is a jalebi right um, there's something sweet and the the person's mind say oh you like it why don't you go ahead and grab it and eat it while the intelligence will say please note that it is not correct you are diabetic and if you eat sweets you know your disease will aggravate so better not eat this so mind says you like it and you eat it but intelligence the person has to use the intelligence right and decide whether it is correct or incorrect right so this is an analogy which is further explained in katha upanishad right 
this whole analogy of relationship between senses, mind, intelligence, and soul, right? So in Katha Upanishad, it is compared that our senses are like five horses of a chariot. And chariot is basically our body, right? And this chariot is basically uh, has five horses and the reins of the chariot is the mind, right? And the person, the Sarathi, the chariot driver, who is controlling the horses with the reins is the intellect, right? And the passenger who is sitting is the soul, right? So if we have developed transcendental intelligence, right, then we can control the mind. And if, if we have a controlled mind, then we can control the senses, right? If a chariot driver is not expert, then he will not be able to control the horses and they will drive and they will you know, run in different directions, right? And the soul will be in miserable situation. The passenger, which is the soul will be in miserable situation. So you have to have a higher intellect. You should have a transcendent intellect to control your mind and the then mind will control the senses. So I hope, you know, it, it is now a little more clear to you what is the relationship of science, senses, mind and intelligence versus soul. So I just want to pause here and check if you have any questions on this. Okay, if not, now I'll tell you, you know, what's, what's the false ego. Now, false ego is what forces us to think that you know you are this body and you have to do everything for this body you know it will make us forget that we are soul we are not this body right and we see here that you know this person is in a miserable situation right just holding on to a branch of a cliff right and there is a helping hand coming to help him but in order for him to take the help, he will have to release the false ego, right? So there will be many situations, many circumstances where we will see spiritual personalities, right? Where we'll see Bhagavad Gita is there in our houses. Srimad Bhagavatam Ramayana is there in our houses. But unfortunately, we are so busy in taking care of this body that we hardly get any time to associate with saintly people, right? Or to open Bhagavad Gita, try to understand, which is very unfortunate, right? So if we have to take help, then we will have to leave our false ego, which is always dictating us that we are this body, right? So furthermore, let's see what Krishna says about the relationship of body and soul. Vasansi jernani yatha vihaya navani granati naro parani tatha sharirani vihaya jernani anyani samyati navani dehi. Krishna says here, as a person puts on new garments, giving up the old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones, right? So here Krishna says that every day, right? On in a day, sometimes many times, we change clothes, right? Clothes which have become dirty, right? We will try to take them off and try to wear new clothes, right? Next morning, we take bath and again change clothes, right? So this is very usual, right? A, a very simple and practical analogy which Krishna is giving here. So what Krishna is saying, as we put on new garments, giving up the old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material body, giving up the old and useless one. So when this body is no more in the condition to sustain this soul, then we just give it up and take up the new healthy body. 
the body which we will take depends on what activities we have conducted how we have utilized this body this human body right and what are our desires right on 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 that basis we will get the next body but this body here krishna is comparing with a cloth that if cloth is not of any use if it is old it's dirty right we just take it off and take on the new cloth right and now i will like to share a small video um, uh, on this with with all of you so <laughs> The amazing soul, spiritual entity. The Vedic library states that the body and the soul are fundamentally different. Here in the 22nd verse of the second chapter, the Bhagavad Gita states, as a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. It's a very powerful simile in which we throw out clothes which are of no more use to us and take on and rejoice in new ones. So the death is not really a time to feel sad. We're only discarding stuff which we don't need anymore and which we really are moving on to bigger and better things and nicer things. And that's meant to comfort all of us. But the Bhagavad Gita is probably the central place one would go to when one thinks about eternal life, the reincarnation, as well as the end to the process of reincarnation, the cycles of coming and being and dying come to an end at some point. And that is moksha, of course. So the Bhagavad Gita would be the classical center, the place to go to for all these ideas. By comparing the material body with a dress that is periodically discarded or replaced, the Bhagavad Gita highlights the temporary nature of the relationship between the body and the soul. The impermanence of this relationship underscores that the body and the soul are fundamentally and categorically different entities. It is this radical difference between the body and the soul that makes possible the transfer of the soul from one material body to an entirely different material body, a transfer that is essential for reincarnation to take place. Right, so here we saw that how, you know, it's like, again, the same thing mm -hmm. that we are basically we are basically you know going from one body to another body and uh, it's like changing our clothes right so let me just go on to the next slide here okay so here in the next verse uh, which i am going to share krishna again compares this material body with something else. Ishwara Sarva Bhuta Nam Hirdeshu Arjuna Tistati Brahma Yan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Arudhani Mayaya. The Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjun, and is directing the wanderings of all living entities who are seated as on a machine made up of material energy right so what we see here krishna is saying and krishna is comparing that this soul which is there in the body is like we are sitting in a machine similar to something as car right which is made up of material energy right so as we heard in the video that we are categorically different our soul we are totally different from this body right so uh, here i've compared the body with the car and you know how things looking similar you know on, on both these different type of so-called 
machines, right? What Krishna said in the previous verse, Krishna is comparing this body to a machine, right? Where all the body hydration is compared to water in a radiator, deep breathing is compared to airs in the tires, food is compared to, you know, diesel or petrol and the whole metabolic system is, you know, the, the fuel burning there, right? And, and there are many things like which we can compare between the two. As the car, the, the primarily car is meant for taking us from one place to another place, right? And so is the human body. Human body is supposed to take us from all our sufferings, right? To realize, first thing is to realize that we are suffering and we, and we can be happy. So the, this body is meant, right, to help us through yoga to achieve the spiritual planets, the moksha. Body is meant to help this soul to connect with Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, right? The way cars takes us from one place to another place, the body is supposed to take us from this material world to the spiritual world, right? So... Today we saw that this body is destructible. It is temporary. We change it as we change clothes and it is just like another vehicle, right? And now I will share a story to show how this body can be the cause of our suffering. If we are, you know, too much or unnecessarily attached to this body, and we are forgetful of our constitutional position, right? The quality of the soul, which we are, then we will end up suffering, right? And we will lose this important opportunity, right? To go from material world to the spiritual world. If we have bought a car, Right, and we are just going sitting there in the car and listening to the music and cleaning the car. What is the use of that car if you if you are you know not using it for going from one place to another place, right? And so is this body. And so here we see a prince who is holding um, and taking care of um, you know the cage and the parrot. So she had a singing parrot, a very intelligent and very beautiful parrot, and she had made a gl glittering gold cage for that parrot. Unfortunately, what happened that she was too attracted to the cage and she somehow ignored the needs of the parrot. So she was not feeding the parrot, you know, and day after day, she would clean the, clean the cage, take care of the cage nicely, you know, but she would not take care of the cage, of the parrot right? The cage is meant for the parrot, right? But she forgot to take care of the parrot, right? And she was too busy in just taking care of the cage. What would happen is that ultimately the parrot passed away. And when the parrot passed away, the insane, the insane queen blamed God that he didn't help even though she was polishing and taking care of the cage day and night. Excuse me, you didn't take care to feed the parrot. Although you were taking care of the cage so nicely, you missed to feed the parrot, right? And if you miss, ultimately the parrot will die, right? So the moral of this story is that we are wrong in thinking that it's only the body which needs care and nourishment. So same as this princess, if we end up just taking care of the cage, which is this body, and if we forget to take care, right, the soul, then what will happen, right? Then we are basically doing the same what these princes do, right? So how can we take care of this parrot, this soul? We can take care of the soul by providing proper nutrition. And what is the nutrition for this soul? The nutrition for this soul is the names of Krishna, names of Hari. We 
every session we recite that verse krate yadhyayato vishnu tvetayam yajato makhe dwapare paricharyayam kalo tadhari kirtanat kalo tadhari kirtanat that in kaliyog we can achieve that love by chanting the names of lord hari hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare so this is the nutrition for the soul taking the names of krishna reading bhagavad gita reading bhagavatam associating with saintly people worshiping krishna as we last time we saw in the session that you know what are the important things we should do in order to be successful Duryodhana was materially seemingly more powerful than Pandavas right but what Duryodhana didn't have was Krishna was devotee like Hanuman ji right and if Krishna is not there then Lakshmi will not never be there right so even if we have everything right in our life and we we don't have this main thing which is primarily meant as a nourishment for us for soul right then you know we will be no better than this ignorant princes so we have to take care of this body but also we should never forget that we are the soul and we have to take care of the soul which is the primary which is the primary responsibility you know of all of us right so now on the basis of this i want to discuss another related important topic which is reincarnation right so is reincarnation just a religious sentiment or is there something more logical is there something more scientific to it let's see right so common sense and logical understanding tells us that when a person you know dies how do we communicate the death of a person we would say you know in different languages whether it is kannada telugu tamil hindi english whatever sanskrit russian persian whatever it is it is communicated the person has left the body usne sharir chhod diya right this is this is you know in in general way we we speak like this right and when we say that now we are taking this uh, dead body for cremation what do we say right we are taking we are going to cremate the body right the person has left right this this person has left but now we are cremating the body right so this is in a common sense and you know general how do we communicate with each other right now let's go into little more deeper into it right now i will give you a example of a person who actually remembered his past life his name is he deep kapadia and he is now a professor so this boy was born in mumbai maharashtra right and when this person started speaking when he was 2 and 1/2 3 years old this person started speaking something and the language in which he was speaking was not familiar to the parents right so this language was totally new to the parents they have never heard of this language and they found out that this boy this child was speaking in marwadi right and these parents were shocked and he used to often say that i want to go and meet my children you know they are there this and that and they try to show it to different doctors right to give to get their opinion and finally they ended up with a group of doctors who were working with dr steve evanson right this per, this particular doctor from north america is working on, on almost he has worked on 3000 cases of reincarnation you know people who remembered their past lives and then these doctors said that you just follow what he is saying you know don't tell him what you are doing but you know if he wants to go to some place just take him to that place and let him identify right so this this boy used to tell them this child used to tell them that i am from rajasthan udaipur that's why he was speaking marwadi 
right so they somehow took him to udaipur and he he would was able to recognize right he hugged there he identified his house and he hugged a 33 year old man and he said that he is my son and that that person was also shocked like what is what is it <laughs> right is is it it is there some plan to you know grab my property or something why have they come here who is he who is saying that i am his son he is just a baby right small boy and and he was shocked right uh but then uh you know he revealed uh, you know few things which were really alarming to everyone um so this this uh, this uh, person who was in idapur whom uh, deep kapadia said was his son he asked okay if you are my father you have to tell me some secrets which only you and i knew okay so just tell me um where have where have we kept the rifle right um which was in our house and this boy he went you know he removed uh, one of the paintings in the house and he said that behind that painting is a cupboard and uh, and he he just took the rifle out and that person was shocked right and he revealed many similar other things right and he he was basically a security guard in museum of udaipur so in the museum there was a fan which will which was operated using kerosene and it was only he who knew how to operate it and after his, his death no one was able to operate so he went to the museum and he showed that how he would operate uh, this fan right so uh, you know it was well established that you know this person has taken rebirth right so with these things and you might have heard about near death experience of people you know that how uh, out of body experience is what we sometimes say that you know when a person is being operated given anesthesia and all you know he would observe his operation and things around you know so these are known as out of body experience and there are books you know on these experiences and these you know people who have reincarnated reincarnated right so all these things basically scientifically establishes the fact which krishna is highlighting in the second chapter right that we are not this body otherwise how would this person remember his past life right if he if we are just these bodies and you know because the only common thing between deep kapadia and his past body is the soul right otherwise there was nothing no common platform right so i will like to share with you another you know one interesting video in which how a person would reveal his past life okay One of Dr. Tucker's most celebrated cases was a boy he investigated from the Midwest of America. Uh, this is a very interesting case of a boy who had memories of being his grandfather, and um, he said that God gives you a card to come back, and I guess this is a drawing of the card that he did. Gus Taylor is the child who drew that card. Since he was a toddler, he has believed that in a past life he was his own grandfather. Gus is now 10 years old. When he was about one and a half, uh, I was changing his diaper on his changing table, and uh, he all of a sudden just looked at me and said, "You know, when I was your age, I used to change your diaper." And I went, "Whoa, whoa this is weird." Gus was named for his grandfather and his full name is August. His grandfather had died the year before he was born. So he really didn't he he never got to know his grandfather. But um he would insist that he was Grandpa Augie. If if we were referring to Grandpa Augie, he would just say um you mean me? You know, he was just very adamant like we should know that he is Grandpa Augie. Where's me? <laughs> <laughs> Where's me again? See if you can find me somewhere else. Gus was four when Ron was given an old family album. To his parents' astonishment, Gus was able to point out his grandfather 
in an old school photograph. He also correctly identified this as the first car that his grandfather ever owned. He showed me a picture and then I said, that was my first car. And then my dad was like, hmm, that's weird because the car was Grandpa Augie's first car. So it was all good. <laughs> Kathy and Ron were intrigued by their son's ability to identify his grandfather in photos. But one day, Gus told them something that turned their intrigue to shock. Gus and I were chatting, and he started saying something about Grandpa Augie, which wasn't unusual. And I said to him, when you were Grandpa Augie, did you have any sisters or brothers? He said, well, I had a sister, but she died. And so that sort of caught my attention because, you know, we haven't had any deaths in the family. And uh, um, he said, well, she, she died. And um, I just sort of looked at him and he said, yeah, she turned to a fish. Uh, she died, some bad guys. I just was flabbergasted. I really was just so, I was speechless because I, I just couldn't understand how he would know anything about that. Apparently what happened was his aunt was murdered and um, her body was dumped into the San Francisco Bay. He, there was no way he could know anything about her circumstances and how she died because it was never discussed and was barely discussed with me, with him and my family. Okay. To hear my son, who didn't know my father, didn't know his aunt who was murdered, speak about this and because that's when I just went, there's something going on here that I just don't understand. For many in the West, reincarnation is an alien idea. Chris French believes that it's simply a comforting illusion which helps some people avoid the difficult realities of death. Right, so I just wanted to share with you you know, another story, this is a video which you can see and I can share with you on the group. So it, it talks about, again, the same thing, which is reincarnation, right? That how this boy, August Taylor, would recognize, you know, when he was basically his own grandfather in the past life, right? So we just saw that how we are not this body, we are soul, right? but we do have to take care of this body. Never forget that we are soul, right? Don't get unnecessarily attached because any unnecessarily attachment to this body will pull us away from our primer, primary responsibility, right? Which is to take us, right? From this material world to the spiritual world. Okay, let's go on to discuss another cause of suffering which is attitude of comparison. And in this, in this photograph, you will see how these you know, kids are eating ice cream and this boy is not looking what he has in his hand, but what his sister is eating, right? And you could see that you know, it's again being envious of what his sister has, right? And here I would like to share another anecdotal story of a Kali worshiper. Now this boy, this man basically you know, used to worship Kali for material prosperity. And being satisfied uh, with her worshiper, she came and she granted this benediction upon him that, okay, whatever you wish your grant will be fulfilled, right? Your wish will be fulfilled. But she also said that your neighbor, your neighbor will get double of, you know, what you will get. And he's, he didn't understand, he didn't quite understand, but he was really very happy with what has been uh, given to him as a, as a benediction, right? So he, he wished that he should have one car and, and then he found that, you know, he got a car. And surprisingly, he saw in his neighbor's house, he saw and there were two cars and wow, what's that? So, you know, his, his happiness was sort of short-lived, I would say, that he was happy receiving a car, but he was like sort of, you know, oh, how come my neighbor has two of them? And then he's, he, he thought that, okay, you know, I should have better this, better that, and he always got what he wished for. But then his neighbor would get double of what, you know, he got. 
so he was somehow very very unhappy not because he didn't get what he wished for but his neighbor will get double uh, of what he would get right and then finally he said he was frustrated you know he was so much frustrated that what he asked was okay that my one eye should go blind right and you could understand why this <laughs> fellow is asking this um, sort of very odd uh, wish that my one eye should go blind because he wanted that both the eyes of his neighbor should go blind right so we go crazy sometimes we go crazy in this world of comparison right and this is where we have to be content you know whatever acharya say about this is that we should live simple life right live simply but you you know you have high standard for your peace for your happiness which is the most important thing right again i'll i'll share with you a series of uh, pictures which show that how people live in this world of comparison now this person you know on wheelchair is thinking that how lucky is this fellow who is at least able to walk right but here the person who is walking you know he who didn't have any other thing as a mode of transportation was seeing and little envious of this person who had cycle and the person in cycle was envious of person who had this basic car right and then the person who had the basic car was thinking oh if i had this car which was better you know um, and this goes on and on and on right we are the the person who had best of cars would think oh only if i had something better to avoid all these traffic jams right so this is what we call as world of comparison right and we have to be very careful that we don't end up spoiling our lives living in this world of comparison and here is teachings you know from shrimad bhagavatam on this here it is said swadharm acharam shaktya vidharma cha nivartanam devallabdhena santosha atma vich charanacharam the translation is one should execute his prescribed duties to the best of his ability and avoid performing duties not allotted to him one should be satisfied with as much gain as he achieves by the grace of lord and one should worship the lotus feet of a spiritual master so here in shrimad bhagavatam it is specifically highlighted highlighted that how we should be doing our duty our own duty that we should work according to our own nature right work is basically meant for satisfaction of mind unfortunately you know this world in which we live you know which we see outside the world of comparison you know the world of just you know going crazy about craving so many things is not what bhagavatam or bhagavad gita teaches us right the bhagavad gita teaches us that we should be satisfied with what has been allotted to us rather than just you know trying to hanker for things which are impossible but it does not say that we should be lazy right that you know i should just i will get everything no you know bhagavad gita and our scriptures doesn't say that but also it doesn't say that we should go crazy right that why i am not able to do this why am i i don't have this that the other person has so many things right so you should not be lazy and but you should not be crazy as well right we should not develop inferiority complex right that i cannot do this and that right and because you your personality your soft skills your characteristic is is given for you to perform a basic task right so you should not unnecessarily go in depression you know have that lack of confidence right be happy with what you have and also you know we should not you know have that opposite tendency of developing you know superiority complex that you know i can do everything i can do anything 
right? Unnecessarily develop that pride, you know, that arrogance, that overconfidence, right? We should be always humble, right? That is very important. And also when we, you know, our body has to work, we have to work to keep ourselves healthy, right? Otherwise, if we don't use the body, it will be like an, you know, a rotten fruit, right? You have to use the body in a right way, right? But don't go, don't be anxious, right? Don't be proud, don't be arrogant. So these are things, you know, which our scriptures do tell us, right? For example, we see, right, that sometimes we are not satisfied with our profession. And we will see that, oh, this other person is good. If I had become a doctor or if I had become an engineer or if I was a businessman or this and that, right? Uh, what we say in Hindi is, um, Dusre ki thali mein ghi jada dikhta hai, right? We always think that the other person is more happy, right? So we have to avoid that tendency of comparison again, right? That if I get that higher position, if I get that higher title, if I am promoted, I'll be so happy, right? We see that in the corporate world. And unfortunately, you know, our own experience is that not every person is meant to do everything. Right. And that is what the management principles talks about, that we have to, you know, allocate a particular task to a particular person, depending on their skill set. Right. And which is what Bhagavatam is teaching us. Sometimes, you know, people, they really put a lot of pressure on their children that no, somehow or the other, you should crack this exam. You have to get into the medical college. You have to get into IITs and this and that. Right. And what happens? Unfortunately, we see even this young kids attempting, you know, suicide, unfortunately, because of the, the pressure from parents, the pressure from colleagues and all. So we have to really take care of ourselves. Right. Be satisfied with whatever results are achieved. You know, it's not that we become lazy. Right. If we don't have to neglect our basic responsibility. But we should not be over ambitious, right? This all is meant ultimately to give satisfaction to the mind and to God, right? This is not just, and we saw how, even if we have everything in our life, right? What we saw in our first session on happiness, we will not be happy, you know, and our condition will be same as a fish taken out of water. So if we really want to be happy, we should keep ourselves connected to spirituality and then do our basic responsibility. Try to be content, right? Don't be over ambitious. Work hard, but don't work so hard that you forget about your basic responsibility, the basic responsibility that you are a soul, that you have to, you know, nourish the soul by spiritual activities, right? So, Again, an important lesson for all of us, right? So this is, again, I will try to, um, you know, discuss something uh, about the attitude of comparison from, from Ramayana, where, you know, when uh, Ram Bhagwan had to cross this ocean, right? And the whole Varad Sena was busy constructing this bridge with the stones, right? And Hanmanji, was doing Herculean tasks by throwing big, big stones and all the monkeys. And there was this little squirrel, you know, who was doing her bit of it. She would take small grains of sand and try to push them in the water, right? And then Hanmanji said, you better don't disturb us, right? Otherwise, you know, you, we don't need you, we are there. We, we are constructing this bridge. We don't need your help. You please get aside. And then Ram heard this, right? And then Ram Bhagwan came to Hanmanji. And he said that for me, both of you are doing equal service because both of you are trying to serve me with best of your ability, right? So I see that squirrel throwing though that small grains of sand is equal to your throwing the big stones, right? So the moral is that we should try to put our best effort and never be proud of our service, 
don't develop that superiority complex right and also don't develop that inferiority complex our talent and ability whatever they are big or small lord sees it with equal vision he would never discriminate right lord is most pleased with the love and care we show for him and for each other that is the most important thing for him that you know we should not be arrogant we should not be proud right we should try to help each other try to support each other in this life right so these are some of the lessons which we have learned from this attitude of comparison that we should perform our duty you know don't develop these inferiority superiority complex don't have unnecessarily unrealistic expectations or ambitions right try your best and be satisfied with whatever result are achieved right be content right and duty your work is ultimately meant to give satisfaction to the mind right unfortunately where the world is going right we think our success in our work by the fruits we are getting by the salary we are getting by the recognition we are getting by the fame we are getting but actually that is not the purpose of work right it is not that we should not take care of the these things right we should not be neglectful but the ultimate purpose of work is satisfaction of the mind right taking care of the basic necessities right rather than hankering after the luxuries of life simple living high thinking is what you know the spiritual leaders teaches and now finally i will turn on to the last um, cause of suffering which is doing wrong acts right and what krishna has to say on this in subsequent verses of chapter 2 of bhagavad gita okay here krishna says dhyayato vishwam punsa sangaste shupajayate sangat sanjayate kama kamat krodha bijayate while contemplating the objects of the senses a person develops attachment for them and from such attachment lust develops and from lust anger arises so here krishna is explaining the sequence in which we develop attachment and if our attachment is not fulfilled then you know or if we keep you know contemplating then we will develop lust right lust means trying to have something unethically you know trying to hanker after something which is unpractical you know unachievable right and if somehow we get that you know then we develop greed and if we don't get that right our what we are hankering for then we develop anger right so i have put it in a you know slide format just you know show you that these are some of the sense objects you know in our contemporary world uh, which we are attracted to right so these are the sense objects and we if we contemplate on them we develop an attachment and you know television is a prime example the billboards are prime example of how the corporate world you know is trying to get us hooked on to these things right try to create um, you know a hankering for those things that without these things you will not be happy and if you just had these things you will be the happiest person on earth right and this is you know what i always call tv as terrible virus you know which is more dangerous than the corona virus right so because we develop so much of hankering for these things that we develop deep attachment and if attachment you know it 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 continues it increases then we developed a lust you know it is like deep hankering to achieve that somehow or the other and if we don't get if if that you know it is unfulfilled that desire that hankering to get then we developed a strong anger you know so that is what krishna said in the previous word dehayate pumsham krishna right now thereafter what krishna says after anger what happens let's see krodha bhavati sammoha sammoha smriti vibramha smriti bhrimsad buddhinasho buddhinashad pranashyati 
from anger complete delusion arises and from delusion bewilderment of memory when memory is bewildered intelligence is lost and when intelligence is lost one falls down again into the material pool right so here krishna is highlighting what is the first further course of action you know when we develop anger after that what happen bewilderment of mind and that goes on to develop loss of intelligence we just become crazy you know you might have had experience in your life right that when we are angry you know our mind and intelligence they stop working we just go crazy right insane we sometimes become insane and then we end up doing things we should not have done right so that is where we have to take care of these things that and krishna will tell us that how and what should we do in order to stop this sequence of events whereby we will end up becoming insane and doing wrong acts right what krishna says is nasti buddhir ayuktasya na cha yuktasya bhavana na cha bhavayata shantir ashantasya kutha sukham krishna says one who is not connected with the supreme can can have neither transcendent intelligence nor a steady mind without which there is no possibility of peace and how can there be any happiness without peace so this is the peace formula krishna is giving us in bhagavad gita that how we have to control ourselves right how we have to train our mind so krishna as you as you saw krishna is saying one is one who is not connected with the supreme in krishna consciousness cannot have transcendental intelligence right so we have to connect ourselves with krishna by the way of chanting his names hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare by reading bhagavad gita by listening and hearing to lectures like this one you know here you know other nice lectures uh, on bhagavad gita bhagavatam and this way you know we will get what krishna says transcendental intelligence and once we have transcendental intelligence right higher intelligence then we get a steady mind and once our mind is steady right mind was con- compared to that reins of the chariot so transcendental intelligence will control the reins and it will then the the horses will be very well controlled so then we will be in peace if we have a steady mind we will be in peace and only when we are in peace we will get happiness okay so in this verse we saw that how krishna is telling us that how we can protect us from getting angry from you know becoming insane from doing wrong acts and then krishna says that even if you put little endeavor it will always help you neha brikam nasho asti pratyavayo na vidhyate swalpam api asya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat in this endeavor there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear right so krishna is saying that you know you must have seen if you have small kids you know when they are learning to walk they will fall down right they will often fall down but you will not be disheartened seeing them right you will take care that it should not hurt them but you know that falling in a course of learning how to walk is natural right so if someone has to learn swimming first they have to go in water right similarly if they have to learn walking they will definitely fall right but we have to support them right we have to help them to learn right walking similarly when we are trying to come up in a spiritual life you know by by chanting the names of krishna by associating with devotees it is not that you know instantaneously our problems will be resolved right it it will take some time the way when we switch off the fan 
you know the fan will take some time to come to a standstill position right we have already cut off the electric supply right similarly now when we have started connecting to krishna it is similar to that but all these anarthas which are there in our heart from un you know uncountable lifetimes they will get some time but we have switched off the button so the fan will definitely stop and we will be happy right so have some patience that is what krishna is saying here okay so here we come almost to the end of today's session and uh, today we learned about these things attachment to temporary things especially body is the root cause of suffering comparison creates unnecessary anxiety uncontrolled sense object will drive us insane right so we have to take care of these things right the practical tips of the day to overcome suffering as perform one duty to the best of our ability right don't develop superiority inferiority complex don't have unrealistic ambitions in your life right simple living high thinking is the philosophy you should live in be satisfied with whatever result is achieved right and duty is meant for the satisfaction of mind not to prove anything to this world right because i tell you whatever you do for people around you they will never be satisfied but you have to you don't have to be neglectful you have to do your responsibility right don't try to make someone you know happy by going extra unrealistic miles i would say right try you know try to do your duties as a grahastha living in this grahastha ashram we cannot be neglectful to our families right we cannot be even neglectful to the society but we should know you know what is the most important thing right so we can protect from suffering by regular chanting reading hearing about krishna in association of you know his devotees and this is what you know we have been listening and reading for last two sessions krate yadhyayato vishnum tretayam yajato makhe dwapare paricharyaya kale tadhari kirtana that in the previous ages there were uh, you know other ways to achieve love of krishna vishnu like meditation fire sacrifice deity worship and in this kaliyug the same goal can be achieved by chanting the names of lord hari in form of hari krishna mahamant which has been recommended specifically in kali shantana upanishad this is a conversation between brahma ji and narada and it is said hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare idi so dasakam nam nam kali kalmasha nashanam nata parantaro paya sarva veteshu drishyate that hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare these 16 names composed of 32 syllables are the only means to counteract the evil effects of kali yuga in all the vedas it is seen that to cross the ocean of nissens there is no alternative to the chanting of the holy name so i request all of you to please take to this chanting of lord krishna's name in form of this hari krishna mahamant right you should try to at least start with one round of this mala which is 108 times chanting this verse right and you will see how gradually you know it will help you in your life so uh, with this i will uh, like to end today's session i will like to open the floor uh, if you have any questions for me let me see the chat box also if there is anything so i don't see any question in the chat box um so does anyone online has any question okay so there is one announcement which i have to make that uh, we will also be starting this session in hindi because there have been many requests that you know they wanted this session to be conducted in hindi so from next week i am starting a session in hindi also which is why you must be seeing that there are few people who used to attend are not there because they will be attending the hindi session 
so i will share the link if you have any relatives friends who want to attend the session in hindi they can do right and uh, thanks for attempting the quiz uh, which i hope is very helpful uh, and thanks for attending this today's session i wish you all the best in your spiritual life and uh, be happy by chanting of the hari krishna mahamant hari krishna hari krishna thank you so much thanks thanks ishwar thanks for attending Mm -hmm. Thank you.